I'm not the first speaker, I'm the second speaker. Um, uh, and I'll be talking about uh, some work that's been ongoing, um, a big part of my life for the last two decades, really. Um, some of this I have to give you a slight, slight heads up. It's, it's something I'm going to talk about with a slight straw man approach, in the sense that um, some of the, the, the problems and issues that we face, particularly in deep time um, archaeology, um, are very much down to the absence of theoretical frameworks in which to, to, to deal with that data. Um, so it's as much for actually highlighting that and engendering discussion afterwards, uh, particularly over VA, um, as, as I'm actually presenting you with some ideas and some data. So I'll be talking about um, Faust and Petersburg Technocomplexes, which are mark parts of what's considered to be the, the transitional technologies from the African earlier Stone Age um, through the Middle Stone Age. Any of you here Paleolithicists or Africans? Nobody at all. So I can make this up as I go along. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so. Oh, here we go. Um, most of you, I think, probably even with a sort of passing um, interest in human origins or where we think of species, I probably realise there's an awful lot has changed in the last two decades in relation to how we uh, identify and recognise ourselves as a species. So, Homo sapiens. Um, uh, as a biological entity, and more importantly, where this comes from, where this, this fantastic thing in terms of a, a brain develops, um, and how that develops material culture, and how we, we um, have gone from being um, a relative, relatively insignificant part of the um, archaeological record for a long time to be the dominant species on the planet. Um, so when I started in uh, paleoanthropology, um, this book had, had just come out. Um, the Human Revolution, Mellers and, and uh, Paul Mellers and Chris Stringer. And um, it came on the back of, um, uh, of work driven by genetics by Rebecca Kahn and Mark Stone King, which um, looked at the origins of our own species and Homo sapiens as being um, an event that came out of Africa. So we were all related back to a single coalescence event based on mitochondrial DNA. We were a single unified species and we were all African at heart. Um, but from that genetical approach, what happened was a bit of a fudge, for best way of describing it, in the sense that we were biologically linked to an African population that at the time probably was thought to live around about 200,000 years ago, um, but we didn't become behaviorally modern, whatever the hell that means, until significantly later. So a lot of the ideas in this book and volumes of probably the next five or six years afterwards um, had a very Eurocentric approach. So uh, the notion that we were biologically originated in um, Africa, it was a uh, significant biological event. We might then migrate out to colonize the old world, um, and then later the new world. Um, fundamentally, uh, we were becoming modern on that journey. So it was a transitional approach to biology, um, underpinned by some quite dodgy interpretations of archaeology. Um, so it basically talks about a late origin in modernity. So, so becoming, becoming anatomically modern happened before becoming behaviorally modern. Um, and it was very much seen in kind of a standard um, progressive approach, linear approach, to how both uh, biology develops and how culture develops. Um, and it was basically seen as being the human revolution that, that 40,000 years ago or 50,000 years ago, something wonderful happened to make us what we are. Skip forward to 2006. And with the same editors again, I've been forced to rethink, um, unsurprisingly. And this was um, this is this is kind of the developing paradigm that, that a lot of paleoanthropology finds itself in now, um, where we realise that the gentle evidence is much more complex than we thought um, back in uh, back in the the eighties and nineties. Um, that it's complex, it's structured, and we have a lot of evidence from both extant um, DNA but also ancient DNA. Um, and the models become progressively more Afrocentric, and they get, they get pushed back further and further into deep time. Um, so the, the origination of many of the, uh, the salient features of material culture and how we deal with it um, are no longer Paleolithic, they're, they're middle Pleistocene, um, and they're probably occurring around about the 250,000, 300,000 meter mark. Um, and a lot of researchers have tried to apply an evolutionary process to this. I'll come back onto this later because that, I think that's critical because I think how you view evolution um, uh, underpins how very often people are treating this kind of uh, data. Um, but it also recognises that there are uh, progressive degrees of 
archaic behavioral diversity. So humans aren't just the, the um, dominant species having the most going for it. Actually, in fact, we, we, were, we were almost uh, didn't make it. But we look at Neanderthals being complex, um, culture varying um, organisms with symbolic behavior. We look at other archaics um, around the same kind of time. And we have realization that genetically there's significant archaic introgression of DNA into our own lineage as well. So um, we, we have an awful lot of um, hybridization and uh, insertion of ancient genomes into the developing of the human genome. Um, so that's kind of what we see at the moment. Where I've really become interested in this is in uh, looking at this from a, a, a very fundamental evolutionary standpoint. Um, whether it's a long, gradual, drawn-out process or whether it's a punctuated process. Whether it's, in actual fact, there's a process there to pick up or not. Um, I think, in, in, as you're going to see, a lot of data is very, very skewed and biased when we look at these deep time periods. So when, this, when the original book was coming out, uh, first came out um, in 89, you had um, researchers working in predominantly East Africa, um, but down in South Africa as well. Um, who began to realize that, that um, there was not a fair playing field in terms of how publications were being hyped up, talked, and openly discussed. So you have people like Alison Brooks, Sally McBrayety, uh, Hilary Deacon, uh, Christopher Henshelwood, who are re realizing that um, based on uh, emergence of uh, radiometric dates, that um, this uh, human revolution had, had already happened and was happening in very deep prehistory in Africa. So, um, um, the Brazen book talk about the revolution that, that never was, the revolution that wasn't. Um, and the development of things like the pair core technologies, so the Valois, uh, discoidal uh, cores, blade technologies, symbolic communication, um, long term planning, subsistence uh, uh, exchange, um, uh, control of fire, pigments, etc. Um, and uh, essentially having a, uh, a revolution, but a revolution of 250,000. The big question really is whether or not that revolution is real, where does it come from, and how do we deal with it in terms of um, complex social theory? So um, I'm going to raise a, a, a number of different approaches to this. I think some of them are quite cut and dry. They're quite black and white how we, how we deal with, with the data. Um, and a lot of it has come out of uh, reappraising, particularly the, um, the uh, origins of the Middle Stone Age of Africa. So the Middle Stone Age in Africa is roughly in a technological sense, what we might consider to be um, uh, coeval with, um, or most similar to, the Mousterian technology um, of Neanderthals and the Paleolithic of, of Europe, in the sense that it's driven by uh, points, a potential halfing, um, possible introduction of composite technology, um, and blade technologies. And um, for a long time, the, the earliest evidence, or the earliest good date evidence for the Middle um, Stone Age um, was really around at the time of the last, um, last full integration. And then um, a reappraisal of material from a number of, of sites, um, starting off with the Yebel Hood um, cave site um, from Morocco. The Yebel Hood was excavated, I think, in the 1950s originally, and um, there was some degree of association between um, the Middle Stone Age and the Paleolithic technologies and a series of hominid fossils, which at the time were actually classified as being having affinity to the Neanderthals. They weren't classified as being our own species. And then subsequently worked by Jean-Jacques Dublin um, and co-workers um, in uh, the, the noughties um, and um, more recently, <coughs> um, reinterpreted the stickery at the site and uh, reinterpreted the biology of the uh, hominid material um, in uh, conjunction with some new discoveries of fossil remains. And what they suggested, and I think it's, um, it's a relatively sound um, understanding in terms of the morphology, is that this is um, Homo sapiens, this is our own species. What that does is that pushes um, Homo sapiens back to 300,000 in terms of fossil record, which people can debate over the, over the, uh, the dating of the site, and can debate over the interpretation of the, uh, the taxonomy of these individuals. But what it also does, it drags the Middle Stone Age back, or drag the Middle Stone Age back to 300,000 or more. And that's a very critical period, both in terms of African, um, in terms of the archaeological record, the dating archaeological record, but also in terms of the environmental context, um, with progressive verification drying um, from the um, 
late 400, 500,000 wet phase, which you see across much of Central and um, uh, Southern Africa. Um, and people are taking it subsequently further, people like Eleanor Skerry, the, the larger of the co-workers, who begin to look at the nature of this transition and whether or not it's occurring um, in North Africa, East Africa, and the, the thing the interpretation is, or one model that sounds up, is that this is a pan-African event, that this is a structured series of populations working at a continental level. This only came out last year, and I think it's still being heavily debated. Uh, the problem is that the, the Middle Pleistocene in general, um, if you'd read the original Stringer and, um, and um, uh, Miller's book, it talks about the model in the middle, and we're still there. One of the big problems is that we have this um, effectively a global environment that is transitioning from um, quite a, an alien um, environment of the, uh, the early Pleistocene to one that's becoming fully, fully modern for us. When we recognize the same animal species, um, and more importantly, that oscillates between a series of dry um, and uh, cold events and warm and wet events, otherwise known as the ice ages. And there's an enormous amount of, of um, variation in the, in the hominins we find in this site. Um, and they, they've all historically been lumped into something called archaic homo sapiens. And now we're starting, I think, at long last, to be able to divide them up into if, at least population beings and understand how they relate to each other. But there's no clear consensus onto which pigeonhole or which, bo uh, which box you put many of these hominids. But what we have is a, a, a fairly um, morphological diverse range of hominids that fit within the range of our own species. And they run from forest land in South Africa around about 256. Herto in uh, Ethiopia around about 160,000 years ago, the reappraisal of the Ebele Hood. Um, and we can argue, or I'm going to argue, um, Cave of Hearts at around about 300,000 as well um, down in South Africa. But at the same time, we have very archaic hominins um, excluding, um, uh, excluding um, potential early Neanderthals, uh, which have um, smaller brain size and are fully associated with the middle paddock technology. So um, the middle pal elsewhere is, is here. In Africa, we are kind of redating it and reappraising it. And this goes at the same time where realization that there are um, other factors of um, behavioral complexity arising at this time. So for instance, possibility of mortuary behaviors and funerary caching by what is a very archaic common, small-brained, diminutive hominin, uh, at the site of, uh, of uh, rising star from down in South Africa. Again, falling in this critical transition period between um, uh, anatomically or archaic anatomically modern humans. Um, and people like Lee Berger and Paul Dirks um, have uh, tried to argue, John Hawkes, have tried to argue that this muddies the waters over who's responsible for the Middle Pattern Stone Age record in Africa. Um, although, can we start to public it for the best way of dealing with that one? I want to about now. So, what I'm talking about is, is field work that, um, that I've been holding for best part of 20 years now, um, and um, which has had to deal with many of these transitional frameworks. And that's from um, Makpansat Valley in the Poker province in South Africa. Um, Makpan itself is one of the cradle of humankind UNESCO World Heritage Sites. Um, it's a lovely environment. This was my office for a number of years. Um, the worst places in the world to work. It's been explored um, since the 1920s by people like Raymond Dart, um, seeing it with a talented child. It's been purported to um, present very early evidence for human cognition and material culture in Australopithecus, with things like the famous Macrophiles of Hebel, um, which, depending on how you squint at it, looks like a face. Um, it may be real, it may just be the equivalent of Jesus on toast, who knows. Um, extensive work by Philip Tobias, um, not personally, but by sending teams of students into the field, um, but extensively into the archaeology by Rebel Mason in the 1950s, 60s onwards, um, particularly uh, working at site called Cave Haas, which is situated just about here, um, in part of, of this Makkansat Valley. Um, and then in the 1990s, noughties, and then um, currently over the last few years, uh, myself and colleagues like uh, Matthew Sinclair from the University of Liverpool, um, working in this rather lovely area. Um, so geographically, it's here. Um, it's a series of fault-controlled valleys uh, within which there are a number of cave sites that people concentrate extensively on the cave archaeology. That was their major thing. And that ranges from the Linework site, which is around three million years old, through to um, a historic cave, um, which was um, uh, the site of an um, end of any massacre. Kind of massacre in the 19th century, 
and then a whole series of deposits which uh, present um, early Middle Stone Age and later technologies. Um, the issue with the, the Cave of Hearts really is that it was originally excavated by Mason in the um, in the um, 1950s, is that he ended up um, uh, presenting potentially the, the longest archaeological sequence at that time available in Africa. Undated at that time, but he recognised there was a transition across um, uh, 12 archaeological beds between uh, the Ashulean in the uh, beds 1 through 3, um, which he incorporated this thing called the power smith into. And then middle stone made with the technologies arising after that with a clear hiatus in between. Um, and this became the kind of standard model on which an awful lot of um, the, our understanding of the, the pre deep prehistory of Southern Africa was based. Um, when we were there, we realized that the, basically the cave itself is just part of a much larger network. Um, it's a land in the, the landscape. And then basically the entire, we went from um, five recognized sites um, through field walking to over 400 sites um, within this, this general area. And it's very much geared towards expedient tool production on fairly high uh, quality raw material but with the um, penchant for large cutting tools and flake um, production. Um, uh, and then certainly many of the open sites um, prepared for radial technology, blade technology, and the rest. The problem with those is they remain largely undated um, because of their own of their institutional context. So the Falsmith itself, we don't know if it's a real or an imagined complex. It was discovered in 1894 for, uh, by Max Levisier from um, Falsmith Farm in the Free State of South Africa, um, and was looked at, um, the assembly was looked at by um, uh, Goodwin and Radcliffe Brown in terms of the expanding record of the earlier Stone Age Gashalane in South Africa. It was formally pronounced in 1926, um, described as a pseudo Boucher industry, a Boucher on a flake, which essentially means hand axes on flake technology. Um, so rather than using cobbles, you may use prepared, core, uh, prepared flakes to produce hand axes of varying size from Bagie down to Bagie the little things. Um, but it's defined basically by particularly the small fine hand axes, uh, cleavers, and then material that, that essentially would classify as, as middle Paleolithic or middle stone age. So blades, Livalwa technology, um, paired core technology, particularly for flake production, retouch points, Livalwa cores, Livalwa discoids, etc. Um, the problem really with this is, is it seems a transitional industry. Um, so it's a, a way to move from the earlier Stone Age to the Middle Stone Age. The big problem with that, um, one of the problems is, this is a very, very limited di uh, diagnostic list here. Um, the list itself, you only is interested in, in, in the theory behind this, it's Aidan Underhill's work, um, published in the uh, early noughties, is, is very, very good and deals with historical context. And even after effectively almost a century of work, there's still no clear definition. And even that people are active in this area, like Larry Barr and Peter Mitchell, um, talk about it as being um, ill-defined with no clear definition. Um, but there are two major problems. One is that you've got limited range of um, in situ deposits. Keneal Van der Burk, Roy Down, Canteen Poppy, Kaku Pan in particular are the primaries. Cable Haas was on that list. Um, and, but the rest of it is determined by surface collection and um, Extended collections that have very little provenance or good contextual information. Um, and another hill talks about the data basically simply being disseminated by osmosis into the literature. So people think they understand what Thousand is. Yes, it's transitional, but what does that actually mean? And the, the big takeaway from this is we don't know what the hell it means. Um, what we do know is that, that, um, that it's probably masked or has been subsumed into other techno complexes. So, uh, Rebel Mason, Peter Beaumont, and John Vogel did a lot of work in, uh, sorry, Bogle, Bogle and Vogel in the 70s and 80s, uh, looking at the, the large scale assemblage in the Cape of Hearts. It's a massive lithic assemblage. Um, and they classify that as being Farrowsmith. But that's purely on typological grounds, not technological grounds. Still don't quite understand how they got there typologically either. Um, because what it doesn't contain, um, the actual beds don't contain any prepared core technology. They don't contain blades, they don't contain the valve one. Um, and conversely, when you get to the NSA, there are no, um, there are no hand axes and cleavers. So that, two, that disjunction between the two um, technological components. And various other people have come up with, with ways to try and describe this um, and, uh, using uh, technology from Philip St. Petersburg, which again comes from Mason, but which, which was unclearly defined in relation to Thousand when he produced his um, um, uh, exceptional monograph in the 60s on the prehistory of Transvaal. Um, to all intents and purposes, 
Uh, and seven hundred years of being classified. This is this is um, he classifies Petersburg typologically. That still fits into the seven years classified as Farrow Smith and elsewhere in South Africa. They are almost identical. What they begin to separate out on is the technology of production. So actually, how you manufacture stone tools, and particularly in you know, the earlier stages, it's the lack of um, um, of uh, cores, particularly blade cores, where you've got um, hard hammer percussion um, with striking platforms at both um, both ends of the cores, um, and a real focus on uh, point production. But this has been picked up. This transition has been picked up by particular workers working in Kafu Pan. So working with Michael Shazan and, and his groups. And what they're trying to do now is, if you can't define the fabric, so you can't define what transitional um, um, industries are, look for the revolution in them, okay? So still getting mixed assemblages that are effectively um, mixed in terms of earlier and middle stone age. But what they particularly at Kafu Pan, which is down on the edges of the Kalahari, is that they have um, some well-defined, well-dated deposits, which push the dates of what they're being classified as the Powersmith back to um, close on half a million years, or over half a million years, 542 K1A. Um, and the presence of blade tools and um, prepared core technologies um, uh, around the 400,000 year mark, based on OSL dating, um, from which these beautiful points have come, um, and they've suggested that these are indicative of halving. So the revolution, is the use of hunting technologies and, the, and um, so no transition, just appearance and um, out of nowhere, the uh, the use of um, highly refined environmental type technology points um, and halving. And the argument uh, they follow through is that this uh, broadly matches what you find in East Africa with, in terms of co occurrence of Ashleyan with the Valmar in the Captain Formation about 300,000. Problem with this is that. These are, these are actually in a spring deposit, um, and in actual fact that um, uh, context itself may not be as secure as they would like to think it is. Um, there are a series of pipes or tubes within this, and they may actually be, be much, much, much younger, um, but certainly appears to be um, uh, fulfill all the criteria for halving and um, projectile technology of some description. The question is whether or not they are of that, um, of that very, very early date. Um, and this is basically where we find ourselves at the moment. Um, just to give you an idea of, of um, I think, the lack of theory that sits in amongst this. Lack of theory that sits in amongst this. Um, we, we've traditionally gone from the Ashleyan, or the earliest Stone Age, through to the Middle Stone Age, as some kind of magical black box thinking. Is that we know that, that, that this happens. Up until relatively recently, we didn't know when it happened. But there is absolutely no theoretical divide or theoretical construct that's been proposed to be able to deal with that kind of transitional data. Um, and with thinking about this issue, it, it's, um, it struck me that the, one of the problems we've got is this very, very clear disjunction um, or sort of conflation between um, uh, material culture, how we do material culture, and how you then bolt the biology onto that. So there's a biological determinism fitting in this. So essentially, ESA and MSA artifacts are everywhere across Africa. It's just a map, it is a mapping surface of different degrees of density. What we've got is a very, very small amount of biology superimposed on that. But this, this was, um, this was um, a illustration from uh, Foley and La uh, a little two, uh, two years ago. Um, and it dates the major sites, it dates the major techno complexes, um, with where within the dates, this transition being around this 300,000 year mark. And nobody really knew quite what to do with it until last year when the other way could miraculously get stuff after 300,000. And then all of a sudden we have to be able to deal with how this technology transmits or transforms into that technology. Um, but without having any real solid theoretical underpinnings to be able to deal with uh, material that is um, diverse in space and time, um, and in many cases poorly defined both technologically and typologically. And Hillary Deacon was talking about this in the 1970s as being a, a severe problem, and it's not really uh, gone any further ever since. Just to highlight a couple of the, couple of the issues to finish up so I don't walk straight inside of me, um, is that this is one of the problems. This is, these are your African sites. I said Africa is a, is a mapping surface of varying degrees of density. If you'll notice, there's an awful lot missing in there. This is an, a, a, a actually um, fairly um, accurate distribution map of where principal sites are where the major areas of field work are undertaken. 
So Africa, you can fit North America, you can fit Europe, you can fit large chunks of Siberia, etc. It's an enormous continent. We've actually only really dealt with a very, very small area of it, um, and dated even less. Um, and what we're realizing is there's an immense degree of variability, um, both in terms of the biology as well as, as the archaeology. And this then comes to the, to the fore um, with work published um, uh, early on this year, or middle of this year, um, which is exceptional in terms of its provenance and its dating, and that's the work that um, Sally, uh, sorry, Richard Potts, um, Alison Brooks, and others have been doing in the capital formation in uh, Kenya, where there isn't a clear transition. When you actually start looking at these, um, these deposits in detail, there is a clear demarcation between the uh, technologies of the earlier Stone Age, the hand axe technologies, even produced on large plates, and this, these emergent technologies, points, blades of the, um, the Middle Stone Age, all dated to around about 300,000 years. But this time, it's in clear association with the use of pigments and of longest trade resources, up to about 150 kilometers from the, the site. And it fits in um, roughly coequally with what we were recognizing from the Evelyn Hood um, in um, uh, uh, Morocco. Just going to get a shameless plug in at the end of this before any and, and conversations. Is one of the problems has been that lack of fieldwork, that lack of, particularly of, of open sites, an obsession in South Africa with, um, with cave archaeology, with the notion of looking for stratified sequences within cave, se um, cave systems. And this is um, um, the problem is that landscape archaeology is very, very poorly done. Um, except when you go looking for it. And this is what you find when you go looking for it. Oops. I'm going to go forward. Question? The thing with this, I'm not going to tell, if anyone wants to know a bit more about the project, I'll tell you in a, a bit. But this is, when you're actually looking, this is some drone work from not that far from back to Pascal. Every single area of buff covered sand and landscape that you can see there, and it is approximately a 25 kilometre stretch, is an earlier or middle stone age site. Okay, so maybe he wants to go with him as further information about this. But how you deal with these transitional sequences is you, you excavate, you develop theoretical constructs, which I would like to hear more of today, um, and you come up with data that actually straddles these transition, transitional um, sequences and see whether or not at the end of it we actually can't um, do what has been done in later prehistory with these early periods which have been completely divorced of theoretical um, constructs. And that's it. Thank you.